Okay. Hi all, and welcome to this event um, titled Running in the Wrong Direction, Biodiversity and Social Impacts of Emerging Fossil Fuel Production. Very glad you could all join. Um, the discussion we're gonna to have today, which will consist of um, roughly half of the time devoted to remarks by the speakers, which I'll introduce, um, and half of the time for, for well, broader discussion, Q&A, um, has to do with the continuing expansion of fossil fuel production and the impacts it's having not only in climate change, but also with regard to the local environments and societies in which that expansion is occurring. Um, I would like to introduce the speakers in order and I'll share my screen. Okay. Um, is that good? Can everyone see a screen being shared right now? Good, okay. Um, I'm Shivan Kartha, Senior Scientist at Stockholm Environment Institute. And um, I'm uh, one of the co-leaders of this project. My work is in climate change, climate change policy in particular. And I've been um, working primarily on the issue of an equitable international climate regime that would be um, ambitious enough to actually uh, address the climate crisis. And that involves not only looking at the sort of formal structural regime elements, but also how is mediation undertaken in a way that, um, that is beneficial for the communities undertaking it. Next to speak will be Bart Vickel. Bart is a um, senior scientist at Stockholm Environment Institute. And um, he's trained in earth sciences and he's been leading projects using spatial analysis and remote sensing for large scale natural resource planning and conservation. He's been with us for over 20 years working in river basin conservation and climate adaptation around the globe. And in this project, he's been leading the development of spatial databases relating to oil and gas development and their potential impacts. And as you'll see, he's assembled several case studies that highlight the roles of spatial tools in increasing transparency and making the rather vast amount of data that's available now um, useful to civil society organizations working on, on uh, um, the policy issues around these projects. Next to speak will be Omar El Mawi. He's the coordinator of the Stop ECOP campaign, which is a global civil society campaign to prevent the East Africa crude oil pipeline, which we'll be discussing here. And he's director of the Decolonize campaign, a movement pushing for a green and sustainable energy future for Kenya. Next is Diana Nabimura. Diana is a senior communications officer at the Africa Institute for Energy Governance, Afiego. She's also led the implementation of various projects aimed at promoting environmental and biodiversity conservation, as well as community livelihoods amidst, amidst oil risks in the Albertine Graben in Uganda for over six years. After this is Liliana Hauragi. She's a senior environmental justice advisor at IUCN, International Union for the Conservation of Nature in the Netherlands. She has 18 years of experience managing and implementing programs with a focus on nature conservation, human rights, um, and governance. And then Ryan Brightwell. He's a researcher and editor with BankTrack, the civil society organization tracking private sector banks and their impact on people and nature. He coordinates BankTrack's campaign to work on human rights and is involved in the campaign specifically to stop the East Africa crude oil pipeline. I'll start out with some um, sort of framing remarks, um, giving the context for, for uh, um, in which this work is being undertaken. Um, one thing that's become clear, really abundantly clear, is that um, the, the urgency of the climate challenge before us um, is telling us that fossil fuel extraction simply must stop. 
What I'm going to show here is the results of a study published with um, United Nations Environment Program, Stockholm Environment Institute, and a number of other institutes. Um, Ploy Achakulwisit, who's with us, was closely involved in this study and will be able to speak to it as questions arise. What I'm showing is a graph giving over time, over the next 20 years, roughly, um, how much fossil fuel production is planned and projected based on um, national energy ministries, based on um, private sector investment plans, based on the range of data for the, um, for the largest producers um, spanning the next couple of decades. And what we see is top line, which reflects countries' production plans and, and projections. So this is the best reflection we have right now of where, uh, to what extent our investments and engineering plans and construction on the ground taking us in terms of fossil fuel production expressed in terms of total carbon dioxide equivalent. This green band on the other hand reflects a production pathway consistent with limiting warming to two degrees. And this pathway is consistent with what we're seeing in International Energy Agency, IPCC scenarios, et cetera. The lower pathway, the blue one, is what a production pathway consistent with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees would look like. In other words, there's a major production gap. There is much more production happening than we need to happen, than would be consistent with even the weaker of the, um, the Paris temperature goals, especially the stronger. And in fact, production would be roughly double the level required to keep warming below one and a half degrees. The, the brown pathway here, this is the pathway associated with countries' emissions targets. So in other words, even while countries are increasing the uh, strength of their national mitigation pledges, their NDCs, um, it is well known that the NDCs do not take us anywhere near where, where we would need to go to keep warming below two degrees or one and a half degrees. That's one of the main purposes of the Glasgow COP coming up to enhance those NDCs. But what this recent analysis shows us is that countries' plans to produce fossil fuels is even further off track. In other words, the production gap is even greater than the emissions gap. This is remarkable, one, because it's equally important, a, a part of the, the climate challenge as far as trying to get onto a decarbonized path. Um, but it's also remarkable because um, fossil fuel production is so much weaker a focus of climate policy than fossil fuel emissions. And the two both need to be dealt with. Fossil fuel production is a main driver of countries' economies. And it has a political and economic uh, momentum of its own. Um, it will be much, much harder to reduce emissions by simply trying to press on demand if there isn't a, a, a corresponding uh, a policy effort to reduce production. The amount by which production would need to be cut was expressed nowhere more clearly th than in the International Energy Agency's recent net zero by 2050 report, which said achieving net zero emissions by 2050 will require nothing short of the complete transformation of the global energy system. Beyond projects already committed as of 2021, there will be no new oil and gas fields approved for development in our pathway, and no new coal mines or mine extensions are required. This is unambiguous. In order to reach net zero by 2050, which is widely understood to be um, what's needed to remain consistent with the Paris, uh, the politically agreed Paris goals, um, no new expansion of, of oil or gas or coal would be necessary. So that's kind of an important um, background point here, that all of the fossil fuel expansion that will be discussed through the remainder of this presentation 
is all fossil fuel expansion that is inconsistent with our shared climate goals. This isn't a matter of prioritizing which ones should go ahead and which ones shouldn't. This is a matter of working to prevent any fossil fuel expansion from occurring. Now, one additional point I'd like to make um, to clarify is that while most of the discussion here is based on expansion frontiers in developing countries, another recent analysis has shown that most of the planned production over the coming decade is actually in the developed countries. What you see here is the amount of the growth in production over the coming decade that is planned in a number of key producing countries for oil and for gas. And the key point to note here is that the amount of production expansion that's planned in the United States is more than the sum of all the increase in production of oil in the other major producers combined. And the same is true of gas. The amount planned in the US exceeds what's planned in all the other major producers combined. So first and foremost, this is a problem of limiting production in the developed countries that are still expanding. But having said that, I'll go on to pass it to my colleague, Bart Vickel, who will be talking about the uh, implications that we're seeing of the expansion that's planned in the South. Bart? Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, just one small correction. I haven't been with SCI for 20 years. I've been working on environmental issues and planning for 20 years. I've been with SCI for about eight years. <laughs> um, so the main, the main uh, driver or the main ingredient in the expansion of uh, fossil fuel industry is an expansion of, of infrastructure, fossil fuel infrastructure. And as Shivan has pointed out, uh, there's an enormous uh, challenge with getting emissions under control and uh, controlling uh, the expansion of fossil fuel emissions. Um, this project uh, is highlighting an additional uh, aspect of, of this expansion, uh, being that a, the vast, uh, a large amount of the new territories, the new frontiers for the expansion of fossil fuel, in particular oil and gas development, uh, are in areas that are currently uh, still under very large amounts of biodiversity. So as we started off on this project, one of the, 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 the two realizations, one is um, on the infrastructure side and the planned side, uh, information is very disparate and dis disperse. And so we started building uh, a new set of databases that uh, map fossil fuel infrastructure and uh, oil block and oil and gas blocks. But there's also this realization that there's actually a lot of information out there uh, that can be brought together um, in support of this kind of uh, project and analysis. Um, as we started building this database, uh, a couple of these uh, truly visible frontiers uh, emerged uh, very rapidly. And uh, as we can see in the, in, in the image, most of Africa is a, can be considered a fossil fuel frontier and uh, Currently, maybe one of the most prominent cases is the, the plant EA COP, East African Crude Oil Pipeline. Um, and it goes to the next slide. <clears throat> um, but as you see here in, in, in this slide, um, looking at the global south, again, not uh, disregarding that there's an enormous amount of oil development taking place in the north, um, we see that a lot of the new frontiers are uh, in the three uh, regions um, illustrated by this slide. Um, and an additional challenge with this development is that uh, there's very little transparency in how this infrastructure gets developed and who is affected by these developments. Um, 
we've identified a set of frontiers. This is um, mainly based on a, a very uh, qualitative uh, view of the world where we see a, a general overlap uh, between uh, planned areas and, and, and planned infrastructure or planned oil blocks and planned infrastructure. Um, but a key ingredient in all this planning is the investment in, uh, in pipelines and the red pipelines, uh, the red lines indicate pipelines uh, identified by the Global Energy Monitor program, um, which really are the keys to the development. Once this, these pipelines are in place, we unlock a very large new amount of oil and gas development. And so we can uh, start seeing these, these production frontiers. Uh, in this map. Next slide, please. And even though there is not a, uh, a solid database of um, that brings together uh, conservation value and uh, indigenous territories and, and broader societal values of these landscapes, um, when you look at this map, you, you really see uh, a pretty strong overlap between the yellow blocks, which are planned oil and gas exploration areas, and, uh, and the greener areas, which combine uh, intact forest landscapes, uh, protected areas, and, uh, and a broader set of uh, indicators like indigenous territory. So our effort is to, um, to start building a much more comprehensive database of High value landscapes and uh, high value cons uh, conservation areas, and really uh, identify this collision course between uh, fossil fuel development and, and these values. Next slide, please. As mentioned a bit earlier, uh, EA COP is, is a, a really uh, problematic case uh, with a pipeline running from the coast of Tanzania to uh, Uganda along the shores of Lake Albert. Um, a pipeline of 1400 kilometers is, is, is uh, under active planning right now. And once this pipeline is in place, uh, it will provide access to the uh, oil uh, exploration uh, on the shores of Lake Albert. And, um, what we try to illustrate in this case study is that even though you can make great um, environmental impact assessments of what the potential impact of a pipeline could be, and uh, as the industry typically communicates on it, that, you know, we're able to mitigate those impacts and uh, th th there's just a, a very broad uh, range of risks associated with these pipelines that people are not aware of and that I uh, at least need to be communicated to society before uh, a pipeline like this is approved. Um, the pipeline is uh, on, on the drawing board cutting through uh, about 20 uh, protected areas of various levels of conservation. It originates in an area uh, of the Murchison Falls, which is a highly biodiverse uh, place. And uh, my colleague Omar will tell, tell us more about, about that. But um, it runs through uh, a large number of uh, rivers uh, that feed into uh, Lake Victoria. Um, and as we've seen in many places around the world, especially the United States, but uh, also elsewhere, pipelines leak. And so the risk that we're putting these water resources at is, uh, is unacceptable. Um, pipeline runs by uh, a large number of uh, population centers and, and through agricultural production areas and um, is exposed itself to quite a uh, significant risk of uh, damage by earthquakes and, and seismic events. So by communicating this broader range of, uh, of risks associated with a project like this, we hope to add to the, to the arguments of, of uh, stopping this and um, as you go to the next slide, please. Um, and our, uh, our, our, our colleagues uh, with, we will speak uh, in the next couple of uh, slides, but 
but also broader uh, organizations in the, in the region have started to use these materials in communicating these risks to their constituents. Um, and this is just a quick overview for those who uh, are not familiar with the location. The EACOP pipeline is, is uh, in East Africa, in uh, yeah, Uganda, Tanzania, indicated in the map. Uh, Omar, please take it forward from here. <clears throat> Thanks. But for the concise um, explanation of ECOP and definitely putting us on the map. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's always good to speak amongst friends and colleagues. So for this part of uh, the presentation, I'm going to start uh, to just speak on three specific issues within ECOP. Um, one will just to give uh, more background information just for the benefit of those who might not be as aware uh, about it. Uh, and then I'll also now proceed to speak about uh, our reasons for why we are against it, uh, and then conclude by peeling the veil and, and speaking about those who are behind it and the ones who are causing us headaches uh, in terms of why this project uh, is uh, where it is right now. And after that, I would welcome my uh, friend and sister, Diana Nabiruma, to speak on uh, a few other things, including uh, issues around the habitat fragmentation threats uh, posed by uh, ECOP, uh, and then also speak about some of the recent uh, challenges that they've been facing from uh, the civic space constraints uh, against uh, those who are opposed to, to ECOP uh, and what they've been, they've been doing to make sure that they are shielding themselves uh, from those challenges. And our story begins. So um, in, in terms of ECOP, just to add on what but. Uh, has already mentioned as a way of introduction. Um, it's definitely going to be the world's longest uh, uh, heated crude oil pipeline uh, of about 1,445 kilometers, uh, which is uh, just um, a few miles above uh, 900 miles uh, for those who are not uh, conversant with the kilometer uh, as a measurement uh, item. Um, we are definitely concerned in terms of uh, how it's going to be disastrous, not just to the local communities and the people who are living within uh, this, uh, this route uh, or where the pipeline cuts across, uh, but we're also concerned about the impacts to wildlife uh, as well as also the entire planet uh, when we talk about the uh, carbon emissions that are going to be coming from uh, the oil which will be consumed uh, once the pipeline is, is constructed. Um, we definitely, I would definitely like to share as a, as a background information at this point, uh, the fact that, um, you know, we, we the, 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 the pipeline itself uh, doesn't really make sense, uh, not just from an envir environmental perspective, uh, but even from an economical uh, perspective as well, uh, because um, one, uh, the the 216,000 barrels of oil that are going to be evacuated every year uh, to be spent vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, what's going to be lost as biodiversity uh, and the livelihoods of the people who are depending from these lands uh, for their daily livelihoods. Uh, if you do the calculations, um, the, definitely the, 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 the mathematics uh, don't make sense, especially if you're looking at it from the perspective of the government of Uganda and Tanzania and also the citizens of these countries. Um, and, and the Stop ECOP or Stop East African Crude Oil Pipeline uh, campaign, uh, which I coordinate, uh, is um, made of about 260 uh, organizations that are supporting it. Um, and we've been pushing different facets uh, of advocacy uh, in terms of trying to convince not just the governments of Uganda and Tanzania, uh, but also the biggest project proponents, uh, as well as also uh, the banks that have been approached on the project. In terms of why we are opposed to it, um, I, I've already talked about the huge amount of people that are going to be displaced if this project is going to take effect. And as you see on this slide, about 15,000 households are going to be affected. Um, and that's more than 100,000 people uh, because uh, African families, um, we are more blessed and we normally have a bigger number of people uh, within the homes. Um, when you talk about the 
acreage or the, the, the size of the land that's going to be affected. It's about 5,000 plus hectares of land, uh, which are going to be directly impacted. Um, we're also talking about uh, biodiversity and uh, huge uh, water resources. Um, and, and we're talking about uh, both water resources and wetlands. Uh, for instance, um, the Lake Victoria Basin uh, is one of the huge water resources that are, stand to be affected. Uh, and that resource itself supports about 40 million people uh, for their source of water for consumption, but also for food production as well. Um, when we talk about uh, the impacts as well, before we move to the next slide, um, let's also talk about the carbon emissions that are going to be generated by this project. Um, so the East African crude oil pipeline, I've already said it's going to be evacuating about 216,000 barrels of oil each year. Um, and the calculations have already been done and uh, the carbon emissions that will emanate from that will be about 34 million tons of CO2 every year uh, that are going to be emitted. And um, it's, it's actually going to be more than what Uganda and Tanzania are currently emitting, the carbon that they are currently emitting. Um, and, and therefore this means that it's going to be a huge uh, impediment to uh, the carbon emissions um, and climate change commitments that we are making. Um, we have both, not just civil society and people of Uganda being affected uh, by climate change. When we talk about droughts, we talk about floods and different other things that are affecting millions of people in Africa and in Uganda and Tanzania. But we've also seen some of the key government leaders, uh, including even the Minister of Environment, um, co confessing and agreeing uh, in international platforms that uh, climate change is causing a lot of impacts within these areas, and therefore it's time uh, to take action towards making sure that we are, we are, we are moving uh, or coming up with climate solutions, and therefore this uh, East African crude oil pipeline becomes uh, an issue um, that is actually almost hypocritical uh, in our sense. Please, the next slide. Um, you jumped one slide. Um, yeah, so in terms of who's involved, I'll just take a minute on this. Um, so the biggest proponent uh, is uh, Total Energy, uh, which owns about 62% of the shareholding of the uh, pipeline itself, the company. Um, and then uh, China National National. Uh, but the project proponents and it, it was it was an increase uh, from the 3.5 billion dollars uh, that was previously uh, mentioned as the price for for the project and i'm sure um, um, ryan will be coming in with more uh, details and arithmetics around that please the next slide Yeah, so um, when we started and, and Ryan will be coming in later with more details. So the excellent work that has been done by BankTrack and some of other partners that we have within Stop ECOP um, was able to approach the 25 banks that we believed uh, to be considering or were approached to uh, finance uh, the crude oil pipeline. Um, and, and the advocacy and, and the work that has been done uh, has um, gotten us to a point where 11 uh, out of the 25 banks have confirmed that they would not be funding uh, the East African crude oil pipeline. Um, it's definitely a very, very uh, big win for us. Um, and majority of these banks are in Europe uh, and, and in the West. Uh, and the banks that are remaining now are mostly in Asia and specifically uh, in China and, and, and Japan. Uh, so I would assume the next tra tr tranche of the work that we are going to be doing is to be targeting these banks. And I think with uh, the with China and the President uh, Jinping uh, coming up with the commitments to stop uh, any new coal building of coal plants uh, abroad, it's actually giving us uh, a very good platform 
to push the narrative further of including aspects of fossil fuels as well, um, because you know all of them are equally as bad. Uh, the carbon emissions that are coming from both these sources of fossil fuels uh, are as bad, and therefore we don't see why uh, they cannot expand that net uh, to include fossil fuel uh, financing uh, that is uh, with, with ECOP. And with that, I will just uh, hand over to my colleague, uh, Diana Nabiruma, to take it uh, forward with uh, the next phase uh, of the presentation. Okay, thanks, uh, Omar, and uh, thanks to- Yeah, shall I stop sharing and, and pass it to you to share your screen? Yes, please. Um, thanks, Omar, and thanks to the previous presenters. Uh, good evening to everyone. Um, give me a second so that I get the right screen to share. Good evening or good morning or good afternoon. It's evening where I am. Okay, so um, today I'm going to allow me to switch off my video because um, I have better connection when my video is off. Today I'm going to be expounding on, you know, I'm going to be giving on ground uh, information as regards uh, what we stand to lose in terms of uh, our environmental resources, biodiversity, culturally and uh, socially if the ECOP is uh, developed or constructed. So um, I thought I would begin by sharing that um, about the area where oil extraction is expected uh, to happen in Uganda. The first speaker hinted on the fact that uh, the oil discoveries in Uganda, which are 6.5 billion barrels and uh, up to 1.7 billion barrels are recoverable, were made in the Lake Albert area. And uh, Widely, the area is called uh, the Albertine Rift. The Albertine Rift in uh, Uganda is, uh, you know, uh, most ecologically sensitive and also one of the most biodiverse. If you look at the map that's on the screen, you'll see those uh, dark green uh, patches on the map. Those dark green patches show the national parks that we have in Uganda and uh, the majority of our national parks and protected areas, actually 70% of our protected areas are found in the Albertine Graben where the oil and gas finds in Uganda are. In addition, 70% of um, uh, seventy percent of our protected areas, and then eight out of fifteen of our forests are found in um, the Albertine Graben. The Graben is also very biodiverse. It has a uh, fifty percent of our Africa's bird species, as well as amphibian, reptile, plant, and other species. Several of which are uh, endemic, and uh, over forty-nine of which are uh, listed as uh, endangered by uh, IUCN. So of course it's of great concern that extraction is expected to happen in these areas, particularly in Lake Albert and from Matison uh, Falls National Park, after which the oil that is to be extracted will be transported by the East African crude oil pipeline or the ECOP uh, from Hoima that's also still in the Lake Alberta region of the Alberta and Graben to the port of Tanga in Tanzania. Now, um, unfortunately, you know, what has happened uh, as a result of uh, the oil and gas discoveries and, uh, you know, the efforts to develop uh, these discoveries or to extract and exploit and use these discoveries is that uh, we've seen a lot of um, land grabbing and uh, including of protected areas coming up. On the screen is a chimpanzee, beautiful animal. Uh, it has uh, over 98% of you, human beings share over 98% of their DNA with chimpanzees. So we call them our close cousins uh, in Uganda. And, um, you know, um, we have a forest um, in Uganda called Bugoma Forest, and it is a habitat for these uh, chimpanzees. So what we've seen happening is that since oil discoveries were made, like I said, um, people, and especially those uh, connected to the political elite, have been grabbing land. And part of the land, uh, in fact, 8,000 hectares that has been grabbed is a uh, 
a part of Bugoma Forest. And the Bugoma Forest has a, and sugar cane growing. You know, the forest, uh, part of the forest has been cleared for sugar cane growing. The sugar cane is being grown, you know, to among others um, for export purposes, but also the oil and gas sector is being targeted. People are grabbing land in the Albertine Graben with the hopes that they can use the land to either grow crops and supply the oil and gas industry or, uh, um, you know, they can be compensated as landowners in, 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 in the Albertine grabbing. So unfortunately, the grabbing of um, um, Bogoma forest is uh, bad for biodiversity because the forest has over 500 chimpanzees and uh, it's very important for the survival of these chimpanzees. So we need to protect the forest. The forest is also home to an endemic uh, species called the Ugandan manga bee, but because of oil and uh, gas discoveries and efforts to exploit uh, the discoveries, um, the forest, you know, several people have made claims to the forest. Uh, yes, and uh, on this slide, we can see uh, the Goma forest, part, parts of the forest that have been cleared. And um, so a, a lot of, um, not a lot of other, four forests in Uganda are also under threat uh, because of uh, the ECOP. Um, we have Bugoma, because the pipeline is going to pass between Bugoma, Wambavia, and two other forests in uh, Jemukanya and uh, Kasanaka Sambia. Those might be difficult names for you. Of interest to us uh, environmentalists is a uh, Bugoma forest and Wambabia forest. Wambabia forest is a corridor forest. It supports uh, chimpanzees to move between Bugoma and Budongo forest. All those, those three forests are found in the Albertine Graben. Now, um, Wambabia forest, the pipeline is going to pass between Bugoma and Wambabia forest. And passing between those forests could lead to habitat loss for, for, for the forest, but it could also uh, make it difficult for the uh, chimpanzees to connect between various forests. And the uh, people who understand chimpanzees very well have told us that uh, these chimpanzees need to be able to move between Bugoma, Wambabia, and Budongo because they cannot mate with each other. If they mate with each other, they die out. They need to exchange their DNA for their survival rates to increase. So any destruction of Bugoma, any potential destruction of Wambabia, any destruction of Budongo forest portends negatively for the survival of chimpanzees, which are also listed as uh, endangered by IUCN. But unfortunately, because of the ECOP, we see that uh, more pressure is being put on the chimpanzees. Then the other area of interest is um, Katonga River. Uh, four rivers in Uganda are uh, said to be affected by the ECOP, and I'm sure there are several more rivers in Tanzania because the uh, biggest percentage of the ECOP is in Tanzania. And among these rivers of importance is uh, the Katonga River. Katonga River is part of uh, the Katonga Wildlife Reserve, and that reserve is important for the migration of uh, various um, species between Tanzania and, uh, and uh, Tanzania, Uganda, and Sudan. Now, um, the ECOP, it's expected that the ECOP will be developed through uh, Katonga River and the uh, three other rivers in Uganda. And in fact, in the Environmental and Social Impact Assessment Report that uh, was produced by Total Energies and uh, was approved by the Ugandan government in 2020, it's recognized that developing the pipeline through rivers such as Katonga will not only lead uh, to habitat loss, but you know it could hurt the migration of our species that you know, go to various areas for breeding, for feeding if there are droughts in other areas and for other reasons. And this means that survival of uh, uh, these various species, um, you know, is at risk. So the, the animals are endangered. Uh, on a social level, um, Katonga River is very important. And Katonga is quite big. It goes from central Uganda up to Western Uganda. Uh, communities in the, what we call the Kato Corridor in Uganda, several districts in uh, south, southern Uganda rely on Katonga River as their most important source of water. Those districts in uh, that, the area in the Kato Corridor are quite dry and uh, they need Katonga River 
to survive in order for them to access water. And uh, they also need clean water, both for themselves and for their animals. So the risks of uh, building a pipeline through Katonga are immense in terms of uh, if there's any pollution, those various districts in the Kato Corridor and their animals would be endangered if there was uh, an oil leak. And then culturally, Katonga River is part of the culture norms of uh, uh, people from central Uganda. And uh, you know there are certain rules around the river. Their king isn't allowed to 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 bypass or see the river. So it's a central part of a cult of the culture of people from central Uganda. And uh, you know we need to conserve it, but we see that there is pressure and more pressure on the river, which um, which um, is dangerous for the culture culture well being of uh, the people in central Uganda. Then uh, um. Omar talked about uh, Lake Victoria, about a third of the ECOP is going to be constructed in the Lake Victoria Basin. Lake Victoria is very, very important, not only for um, uh, socially human beings in terms of providing food, jobs, and water, but it's also important for um, uh, the survival of, of birds and various uh, other species. And on this slide, you'll see some birds. Lake Victoria is connected to Lake Navgabo, which is very important um, for birds, but also various other 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 lakes within within central Uganda. That you know, if if you know anything happens, if there's an oil spill in Lake Victoria, you'd find that interconnected uh, lakes such as uh, Navgabo and others that are important for migratory birds that come from Europe would be negatively affected. Yes, yeah, so on this slide is a, a, a curious bird. It's called the Jesus bird. I am told that it walks on water. It has webbed feet that allow it to walk on water. And it's found in southwestern Uganda, where the eco is going to pass uh, through, you know, the Lake Victoria Basin, a third of it through the Lake Victoria Basin. So, you know, this, 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 this is part of the biodiversity that we are looking at as being at risk. And we feel that uh, the ACR report that uh, was produced and approved by the Ugandan government, you know, doesn't contain enough or sufficient or adequate mitigation measures to ensure that our biodiversity uh, and cultures survive. So finally, the social aspects, Omar talked about them, the number of families that are going to be affected. But um, even before their land has been taken, we've already seen that a lot of our social costs are being borne by the communities whose land is being affected for the eco. They aren't currently, they aren't allowed to use their land for certain developments to grow perennial food and cash crops. So that has uh, increased the food uh, scarcity amongst the affected families, but it has also increased the school dropout rates because families that cannot grow cash crops cannot take their children to school. And then we've also seen because in, in some areas, in some districts, it's uh, centers or what we call town centers, urban centers that were affected, we find that um, family, family heads are no longer working and they stopped supporting families. So there's been marked increased gender-based violence and uh, several other social issues have occurred. And we expect that this will not only be experienced in uh, the short term, a few did research that we uh, published last year, which shows that uh, the land impacts, the impacts arising from compulsory land acquisitions are felt in the mid medium term uh, because families are unable to replace all the land they, that they lose. And because our livelihoods in Uganda are largely land-based, when families don't replace all their land, then we see food insecurity increasing, but also family incomes decreasing, and that has uh, various impacts. Uh, thanks. Over to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diana. I'll show my uh, screen again, and Bart will continue and then introduce uh, Liliana. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Omar and Diana. It was really, really great to to get such a such a rich perspective on on what's really happening uh, in in East Africa. Um, as mentioned in the chat, 
um, one of the main things that we did as part of our work to, to map and, and illustrate where these kinds of impacts may be taking place and connect those images to, to a broader view is, is a map story that um, currently the beta version is on the, on a platform called Maps for Environment. And as you'll see when you click on those maps is you can interact with the data and um, zoom in where you uh, have a specific interest. Um, there's a broader backstory to that. There's, there's a lot more possible with that kind of platform. Uh, end users can contribute and upload and interact with the data uh, more comprehensively. Uh, and that's something that is uh, a, key, a key pillar in our, in our work. Um, shifting from an emerging, potentially new frontier uh, to an old frontier uh, that has been uh, in place for about 40 years. The Western Amazon, uh, one of arguably the, the, the most biodiverse uh, place on earth uh, in Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, has been experiencing uh, oil and gas development. And in a way, there's sadly no better place to illustrate how devastating uh, uh, oil uh, the oil industry can be in that kind of uh, setting. Um, we uh, started uh, as one of the case studies under our project, uh, bringing together uh, a broad array of information. There are a, a lot of local actors who are uh, incredibly uh, good at, at mapping this with great precision. Um, there's some government databases, and then there's a lot of information that can be derived from uh, newly available satellite imagery. Uh, one of the great advances over the past years has been uh, an incredible increase in accessibility of uh, high resolution satellite imagery through Google Earth and, and other outlets, um, which allow us to actually start mapping things with uh, much more precisely and also monitor changes that are taking place uh, in places where you wouldn't sh and shouldn't have uh, development. As the map here illustrates, it's a little um, busy, but the purple areas are indigenous territories, the green areas are protected areas, and the darker black outlines are um, current oil blocks, and all the other lighter outlines are uh, plant oil and gas blocks. So as we can see here, it's, it's, a, it's a frontier, maybe a, one third of its development. And if we let it run its course, uh, everything in this uh, area will be turned into oil wells. And as we see, um, the red dots indicate oil spills from a national oil, and oil spill database. And sadly, one of the, the things that we <laughs> realized uh, reviewing this information is um, until recently we had the uh, approximate location of pipelines, but all you need to do is really follow the trajectory of, uh, if you look at the, the northwest corner of your image where the pipeline comes in, you just follow the red dots and you know what the position of the pipeline is. And so um, as a great example uh, for uh, East Africa, where the parties involved will say, well, this is not going to spill with all the best, uh, all the best practices it won't happen. It does happen. Um, that said, I think uh, Liliana uh, can speak a lot more uh, effectively to the to what's going on on the ground in in this region, and uh, she she'll be the next speaker. Thank you, Bart. Um, if you shared my first slide, um, thank you again for the invitation. Uh, and this opportunity to share and to complement uh, the vision from the maps uh, to the reality on the ground. So uh, my speak will be about uh, what does it mean for the people and nature experiences this, experiencing this uh, pressure uh, from all these, uh, uh, these plans uh, and uh, what is happening already and what is supposed to happen. I will also end with uh, hopefully a message uh, of, of what we can do uh, with, the, with the current developments in the region. So 
to start, I, I would like to share a, an image uh, of, of what's, what's life there. Uh, this is the, the, the biodiversity of the area. As Bart said, this is uh, the Western Amazon is, is the region with the, the most biodiverse uh, part of the Amazon. Uh, in, um, unlike the Eastern part of the, Brazil, the Brazilian Amazon is an area with, uh, with a largely intact ecosystem. Uh, it's, uh, if you zoom in, uh, the Western Amazon, uh, it, it's not only Ecuador, it's Bolivia, Colombia, Peru, and the Western part of Brazil. Uh, and these scenarios are, are repeating also in these countries. But we will zoom in in, in, uh, in Ecuador. I want also to share with you something fresh from the IUCN uh, World Conservation Congress, uh, because IUCN approved uh, an indigenous people's global call for action to protect 80% of the Amazon by 2025 uh, to avoid this catastrophic tipping point, which is uh, uh, nearby. So an urgent call from the environmental community to concert efforts to protect this last remaining uh, forest, uh, primary forest. Uh, so what we have here is, uh, is, is an area with, uh, which is, is rich and, and, and full of uh, biodiversity in living beings. And here are a small selection of some of the uh, species that we have uh, in our projects. Uh, of course, the, the jaguar, one of the, the five big cats uh, in the world, uh, mammals, uh, these birds, this is an amazing, beautiful bird. Uh, I'll take the time to present them because they are important. Uh, the black and chestnut eagle and uh, the woolly uh, monkey and amphibians. Uh, we have in this region a, a, a dense diversity of amphibians and uh, as we know, the current mass extinction crisis is, is very evident in the amphibians. So this, the presence of these animals uh, prove that still we have a good state of forest. So it's important to, uh, to protect it. There is also a high presence of indigenous groups, including some of the last uh, world's, uh, the world's last uncontacted peoples living in voluntary isolation. But as Bart just explained uh, so graphically with the maps, uh, there are threats and they are immense because underlying these landscapes, we have large reserves of oil and gas, which has been ex uh, exploited already with terrible consequences, but there are many, many projects to come. So next slide, please. So this is something um, I, I also want to share with you, this is the movement from, from the people protecting these landscapes. Uh, this, this, uh, these indigenous groups are uh, what we call the guardians of these areas, are uh, living in, uh, in the world most, most biodiverse uh, areas. Uh, but let me start saying that Ecuador, uh, this is happening in Ecuador at the moment, uh, has a very strong constitution uh, protecting the rights of nature and sometimes used an, as an example for the rest of the world. Uh, in theory, it prohibits the extraction of, uh, of uh, natural resources in protected areas and it protects its peoples. But when you have this so-called national interest is when you see that the, the other, other interests appear and, and other priorities take, uh, uh, take the lead. And you see here, the uh, one I, I have to, to, to pronounce it every time, but this, uh, this group, the Wonarani people, they are uh, a very emblematic case because they are the, the latest uh, indigenous group uh, which was contacted in Ecuador and they took uh, very strongly their case to uh, the courts and, and they won the case. So with this picture, they're showing our, our forests are not for sale. Uh, and they were successful on doing this. Uh, one of their leaders also won the, the Goldman Prize. But these conflicts, of course, are very evident with all the maps that you see. There are clear overlap between high biodiversity areas and indigenous peoples, uh, territories, and protected areas. And as Bart explained, a large part of the Amazon, Ecuadorian Amazon is already planned for uh, oil activities. Uh, 
There is also a very emblematic case, the Yasuni National Park, where these uh, people uh, also uh, live, in theory, under the protection of the natural park. But in reality, uh, what's happening is that, uh, well, the areas are being uh, yeah, degraded by this oil uh, project. And in the case of the, of the Warani people, uh, because they live uh, under, uh, living downriver uh, or from oil operations, they have been affected, uh, the, the, the water sources have been affected. Uh, so this is a clear example of what could happen. Uh, and it's a situation that is repeating itself, not only in Ecuador, you see that in, in other countries as well, and also with our communities inside uh, Ecuador. There is a specific uh, case which is, is very worrying, and that's the, the, the situation of uncontacted peoples living in voluntary isolation. Um, it's, it's a large concern for, for civil society, for local civil society, but also for international civil society, because there is a lack of understanding of the extent of the territories. And Ecuador created a zone for a so-called untouchability. Uh, but there is discussion whether this is the right, uh, it's mapped correctly. Uh, and there are questions about uh, whether this area is it's correct or not. There are some reports of, of people moving uh, inside these oil blocks. So this is a, a very uh, worrying situation. But there are two sides of the conflict. On one side, you have the government uh, claiming the authority to manage these two resources uh, for uh, because of the of the public interest, but on the other side you have indigenous peoples uh, claiming that the right uh, for uh, for the property and and their territory allowed them to exercise their right to free prior and informed consent, uh, and this is a big issue uh, because it's 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 of course a discussion, but the oh, the two words are very important. It's it's informed consent and the part of consent is concerned uh, is always neglected. So uh, next slide, please. I wanted to show you um, an, uh, an project we did, actually together with Afiego. It's um, moving, we're moving now to, to some old projects and how, how the development in the Amazon in, in the past has, has caused so many environmental damages and, and also uh, issues of health for local people. Uh, these pictures are taken in, uh, in, um, in, in a couple of years ago uh, because we try to create a movement of solidarity with affected communities in Ecuador, Uganda, and U the US uh, because many of, of the issues these people face are similar. And what you see on the left side, on the top of the, of the slide, is, is, is the flares of all projects that have been burning with natural gas for, for, for decades. Uh, and in the Amazon, uh, in the Ecuador, there are more than 447 flares that are still burning, burning uh, for decades. And local communities say that, say that this, uh, uh, the fires are responsible for high, high level of cancer in the local area. And something is happening now with the pictures. Uh, yeah, I'm like sorry. <laughs> They're very they nice okay. and beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. So this is on the left side, on the top. And uh, something important is that recently, um, and after many decades of, of procedures, the local community succeeded in um, in in um, uh, yeah in, in gaining the rights and the recognition that that the Ecuadorian state failed to defend their environmental rights. So hopefully, this will start the restoration of the area. On the right side, you see an old and um, oiled fill, and which is solidified. And on the low side, you see uh, a woman defending uh, their territories. And uh, yeah, well, her name is Jenny. And what you see in reality is that many of these uh, vital areas are defended by local people. With, with high risks, and we call them the environmental human rights defenders. And now I'll move to the final slide. So according to international conservation, I want to stress the importance of this, more than 3.8 billion hectares are under indigenous peoples and local communities' hands. 
which means roughly 80% of the remaining world's biodiversity. So protecting these areas and these peoples are vital to bend the curve of biodiversity degradation and climate change. But in the reality, these peoples are also at risk. So taking the last report actually this month published for World War Witness, we see that uh, last year, 20, uh, 227 people were killed because they were defending their environmental rights. Uh, and South America is the continent with the worst figures. And killings are only the tip of the iceberg. The, the pressure on natural resources, uh, what they call here the last line of defense, is increasing every year. And indigenous peoples uh, and local groups are facing the, the, the largest killings and violations. And I want to close my contribution with a message of hope and, and an example uh, from Latin America to the world. The binding regional treaty called the Escazú Agreement, which is ratified by Ecuador, but also entered into force the 22nd of April this year, which is a commitment uh, from the continent to sustainable development and human rights. And uh, the rationale behind Escazú is that access to information in Latin America uh, remains poor. There is widespread impunity and crimes against environmental defenders and communities' rights to consultation on the impact of large development projects are often disrespected. So uh, hopefully, if this is implemented well, this can protect our largest remaining forest and their inhabitants. And all the immaterial values that are there, the values like cultures and also the local knowledge. We always speak about nature-based solutions, but these people have that. And as the one of the IPBS reports uh, stated, and I'm using that on the right side on the, the, in this last slide, it's important uh, yeah, to, to learn from these people how they conserve nature and how they live in harmony with nature. With nature. So, with this final message, I want to yeah, finalize my contribution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liliana. Um, that was a graphic um, um, explanation of both the ecological and the, and the human impacts. And I would like to finally uh, pass it to Ryan, who will give us um, an overview of the work that they're doing in one of the one of the largest and most important initiatives to to um, offer some resistance to these projects expanding fossil fuel production um, based on on pressuring the organizations that are financing them. Brian, thanks very much, uh, Shivan. Yeah, and hi everyone. Um, thanks very much for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you here as part of uh, New York Climate Week and the, the invitation to join this panel. Um, I'm going to speak, uh, as Shivan indicated, about our advocacy towards the banks whose finance is enabling the climate and extinction crisis that we've been talking about uh, on this panel. Um, I want to start with uh, uh, the East Africa crude oil pipeline. A lot's already been said about the ECOP on this panel uh, by my colleagues Omar and Diana especially. I don't want to go over the same ground, but to talk briefly about our advocacy aimed at cutting off the money that this project is going to need to proceed. Uh, this pipeline is looking for a, a $3 billion project loan, and loans this size will need a lot of banks to, to chip in, probably upwards of a dozen uh, banks. And we've been calling on banks, starting with those that, uh, that we know are already major finances of Total, the, the leading company behind the project, to make public statements ruling out finance for the for the project. Um, together with uh, the Stop ECOP coalition, we've sent an open letter to, to banks supported by over 260 civil society organizations showing the, you know, the, the wide strength of feeling, especially from, uh, from uh, civil society uh, in the region as well as globally. And we've provided briefings to these banks setting out the impacts to, uh, to make clear uh, where their due diligence process needs to needs to look uh, as they consider whether to to finance this loan. Um, we've also used the the geospatial mapping tools, uh, the the kind of tools that uh, that Bart has uh, has uh, set out on this call to help make the case to the banks. For example, 
Some banks have policies not to finance activities with impacts on sensitive wetlands, which are protected by something called the Ramsar Convention. Uh, and we used SEI's mapping to, to show banks clearly which Ramsar wetlands the, the pipeline will impact, as shown on the, the, the map on the, on the left of this slide. And this kind of detailed geographic information about where the pipeline is going and where the protected areas are that will be impacted um, has helped persuade um, the banks uh, the, of the, the impact of this project and, uh, and helped lead to, uh, to the, the situation we're in now where, where 11 major banks have, have ruled out financing the project with Mizuho in Japan and HSBC in the UK, the, the latest to join them. Um, there are still banks out there that the project can turn to, but with so many of Total's biggest financiers uh, ruled out, we expect it will be harder now for the project to find the finance that it needs. Uh, so the next slide, please. So uh, unfortunately, the, the ECOP is uh, just one project in a global oil and gas industry, which is still set on expansion. Um, and the reality is that uh, bank finance for, for fossil fuel expansion is essentially proceeding uh, unrestrained. And one reason we're focused on the bank's financing uh, this, this fossil fuel extraction is that uh, the banks uh, are more vulnerable in terms of their reputation often than, than fossil fuel uh, companies. And um, they, they can be influenced to, to improve their policies and they are being influenced to improve their policies around the fossil fuel industry. Uh, but looking at the amount of finance that they're actually providing for fossil fuels, um, it's, uh, it's essentially, uh, it's massive. And the, the Banking on Climate Chaos report that Rainforest Action Network and BankTrack and other allies have been putting together every year uh, for some years now, assesses the scale of bank finance for the fossil fuel industry uh, and has found that, that banks have provided 3.8 trillion in finance uh, since the Paris Agreement in 2016. That's uh, about $2 billion a day. So while the world's governments are aiming to and struggling to put together 100 billion a year in, in climate finance, um, some 60 banks are by themselves providing around six times that each year to the fossil fuel industry. So the next slide, please. So the overall trend in fossil fuel finance from private sector banks is unfortunately uh, increasing. Uh, some better news is that 2020 saw the first decline in fossil fuel finance from the world's largest banks. Uh, however, this, this decline is, uh, is mostly pandemic related. Uh, and the, the trend for the first half of 2020 was still an increase on the first half. Uh, of 2019. So we really need to see this decline in fossil fuel finance sustained. Uh, next slide, please. So which banks are we talking about here? Which banks are the worst offenders? Uh, well, the US banks are by far the largest financiers of, of fossil fuels. JP Morgan Chase is, uh, is leading the, uh, the dirty dozen largest fossil fuel financiers. And the rest of the top four are also uh, large US banks with Canadian and Japanese banks also well represented in the, in the top 12 and a couple of European banks as well. Um, and you might be thinking, oh, I've heard about uh, all of these banks net zero targets. Uh, and indeed, you know, la since last year, almost all of these banks, certainly at least nine out of these 12 have uh, developed net zero targets for 2050. Uh, or in the case of JP Morgan, an intermediate target for 2030, covering their financed emissions. Um, and these, these commitments are a sign that banks are listening and responding to, to pressure from uh, climate activists. But these 2050 commitments are delaying the urgent action that is needed now to, to stop finance for fossil fuel expansion. To take JP Morgan as an example, they have a target to reduce the carbon intensity uh, of the oil and gas, the companies that they finance by 15% by 2030. However, as uh, the, Stop the, Money the Stop the Money Pipeline campaign in the US has pointed out, if a company owns a thousand oil wells and no windmills, uh, and Chase gives it a $10 billion loan to build 400 new oil wells and 200 windmills, then the company is going to reduce its carbon intensity significantly 
and probably help JP Morgan hit that uh, carbon reduction target. Uh, but it will still be growing its emissions. It will still be new building new oil wells uh, in the midst of a climate crisis. So JP Morgan's current climate targets allow it to keep financing fossil fuel expansion for at least the next nine years. Um, also, these banks like to point out that they've committed many trillions of investment into green initiatives in the coming years, which is, which is also positive news. However, banks don't deserve too many plaudits for profiting both off the crisis and the response to that crisis. So the next slide, please. So our call on the banking sector is therefore that banks must stop financing fossil fuel expansion uh, and phase out their existing finance for the fossil fuel industry to zero by 2050 with strong interim targets in line with the Paris Agreement. Uh, and this isn't a call for the overnight end to the fossil fuel industry, but it's a call for the overnight end to its growth. And this would free up billions for financing green initiatives. It must be done in a way that's, uh, that's rights compatible with a focus on supporting a just transition uh, and avoiding finance for companies and projects that are abusing human rights. Um, and this isn't just our call, this is a call supported by over 200 civil society organizations, large and small, who've signed up to, uh, to support it on the, uh, the fossilbanks.org website. So uh, the good news is, go to the next slide please, uh, that more and more groups around the world are working together to target fossil fuel financiers with campaigns multiplying in the run up to Glasgow, targeting specific banks or calling to halt to finance for specific projects. Uh, and the Fossil Banks No Thanks platform uh, on that website, fossilbanks.org, aims to bring as many of these efforts as possible together uh, on this slide are some of the, the platform partners uh, and provide a shared resource for campaigners, show the strength and the diversity of this growing movement. So, uh, so we invite organizations to, to sign up to support this call on banks and also to join the platform if they have uh, campaigns at a local level on uh, banks and, uh, and climate change. Uh, and the last slide, please. So um, this activism is having an impact. Uh, the Dakota Access Pipeline was an example of a project that, that did get financed from private sector banks, but the backlash, the backlash against the banks that financed that project was massive uh, and led to, led to some changes. Now the East African crude oil pipeline is struggling to find financiers. The Lamu coal plant in Kenya uh, it's just one example of a project that has been cancelled after the international, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China uh, pulled out. Coal plants around the world are being cancelled for lack of finance and China's commitment today should hopefully uh, accelerate this. But we can't keep financing, we can't keep fighting one project at a time. We need to demand that, uh, that our banks stop using our money to stop financing um, fossil fuel expansion everywhere. Um, and we need to see as many banks as possible come forward with much stronger uh, commitments before the Glasgow summit in, uh, in 39 days time. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll pass back to, uh, to Siobhan to, uh, to queue up this, uh, the discussion session. Thank you very much, Ryan. And thank you to all of the speakers. Um, I, uh, I, I, I think that the main point of what we've been trying to present is that when you look at the look at the increasingly unambiguous information from reflecting what's happening in the global situation, both with regard to the climate challenge, which has become a climate crisis, and the biodiversity challenge, which has become an extinction crisis. Um, the message out of them both really is that uh, fossil fuel expansion has to stop and fossil fuel use has to be phased out. And what we've tried to do here is use, um, from SEI's perspective, use the increasingly um, massive and sophisticated and um, still expanding set of data that's available from um, uh, remote sensing sources and, and big data sources and turn that data into information, into useful information that the organizations located in the regions of these individual fossil fuel expansion projects can make use of. 
can make use of in their own efforts to deal with, um, with uh, the local efforts to expand fossil fuels, um, um, to resist those efforts. Um, what I'd like to do now is use the remainder of our time, which is about 15 minutes, I guess. Um, sorry, we seem to have gone over. I hope it was useful information to um, take any questions that, um, that uh, audience members may have. Oh, Morgan corrects me. We, have, uh, we don't have uh, an hour and a half, we have two hours. So we have 45 minutes uh, that we can use for question and answer. Um, I would welcome the other speakers to, to come on camera again, and I welcome guests to, um, to just type any questions into the, into the chat box, and we'll, uh, we'll, um, we'll direct those to the, to the appropriate speaker. Um, while you think of any questions, either relating to individual points that were raised by, um, by particular speakers or, or sort of overall questions about the challenges facing us and what we're, what we're um, endeavoring to do about it. Um, while, while folks are coming up with the questions, I, I have a, a, few, um, a few angles on, on the discussion that I'd like to open up. Um, and the first is the following, and I guess, it's, I guess maybe it would be most appropriately directed to Liliana and Diana, who are both in their own ways involved in the governance challenges in the regions that they're working. Um, so one of the main purposes of civil society organizations, it seems, is to take the, um, the laws, the regulations, the governance institutions and their, their, their uh, respective um, domains of authority uh, seriously and to hold the government to account to enforce its own laws and to uphold its own regulations. And I'm wondering if, um, if, if there's anything more you can say about ways in which um, access to information, access to data and challenges in getting that data, um, um, how, that could, how that could make it, uh, um, how that could be useful for you in your efforts dealing with governments and providing, providing arguments um, um, as, as you interact with, uh, with uh, the local governance procedures there. And I, I um, raised that in part because one of the things that Bart pointed out is that in addition to the potential impacts from expanding projects, one of the really important um, um, sets of conclusions one can draw from this kind of work is the impacts that have already occurred from existing uh, fossil fuel projects, which gives a strong basis for, for drawing conclusions about what will happen if expansion happens further. I can start saying something and maybe Diana can complement because I imagine that there are similarities between the regions. Um, so as I said, the, the, the problem of information, the accessibility of information, information that is understandable for local communities and information that is seen as neutral, it's very difficult. Uh, so every every map of every uh, fact, it's always discussed and, and put in into uh, debate. Uh, it's, it's debatable. So the importance of uh, information which is uh, yeah, reliable and neutral is is uh, crucial. Uh, as I said, the, the the this new treaty, yeah, this binding treaty, it's all about access to information, but the information has to be there. And that's uh, still a problem. It's not only a matter of capacity, it's also a matter of, uh, of accessibility, also a matter of that communities understand the maps. Sometimes you have to translate uh, the, these maps that we have been seeing for, for, for local communities and indigenous peoples are difficult to read. And uh, so um, it, it's 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 uh, very abstract uh, for local people to read. So that you need to translate that as well. So there, it, there are several steps that you need to 
to do in order to uh, help local communities to take informed decisions. Uh, so availability and, and translation is, is important. And that's the role of, uh, of local civil society uh, because they are, uh, I think, central. But international civil society can also help with the validation. Uh, so that is less discussion whether this is neutral or this is again uh, lobby from some of, of the social groups, which is generally the case. Uh, so I hope this is a part of the of the of the answer from my perspective. Uh, I don't know, Diana, if you can also complement. Um, could you repeat the question, please? Thank you. Yeah. Um, given the ways that you are in a position of interacting with your government and and helping to pressure them to enforce existing rules um, and laws what ways can information uh, such as the information that uh, this project is making available um, provide useful input and be a useful tool as you're as you're trying to do that what types of information or in what forms oh, okay um, thank you so um you know i can relate with uh, what liliana has said um, access to meaningful information that can help uh, decision makers, but also communities to understand what the impacts of are the projects that are proposed or the projects that are, you know, that are being implemented are, is uh, still limited in our settings. And, uh, you know, big reports are produced and, you know, sometimes there's not enough discussion of the impacts because the, you know, there's a lot of impacts that are going to occur. So, and the report is already very big. So you try to summarize as much as possible. So there's a lack of in-depth information sometimes, but also there are instances where there are opportunities to provide in-depth information, but we see in our context that uh, because communities, uh, you know, stakeholders don't want communities to be, you know, genuinely aware of what's coming or what's happening in another area where oil impacts are. And, you know, we have a, a statement, uh, the impacts of these are insignificant or you could suffer health, health, uh, sorry, I'm being told that my internet connection is unstable. I hope you can still hear me. So you can, the communities can be told you could suffer health impacts because of this, but the gravity of the health impacts isn't explained. So there is an issue of sometimes the reports are too big. So there's no in-depth information being shared or there's a deliberate effort to hide information. And uh, what we do as a FIEGO and our partners, uh, radio is the most used medium of communication, but also, and we are an oral society, we love storytelling. So meetings with communities, radio talk shows, uh, short films are used to communicate, to try and fill that gap, but gaps certainly still exist. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Um, I, I'd like to follow up on that. Uh, with you, Bart, and bring in a question that was raised by Shell, um, who said that this is, we've referred to this in one slide as an early warning system. Um, and Shell is pointing out that the ability to, to um, challenge a project early on um, is very helpful. Um, you, Bart, had mentioned the, the development of what you refer to as a transparency tool. And um, and um, um, have mentioned the, the value of something that's interactive and open access and easy to use and makes this data available to, um, um, to any, any groups needing to use it. Could you just say more about that and how that might unfold and how, how you, um, yeah, how you, how you would uh, propose it being used? Yeah, no, that's, it's, it's one of the core questions, right? So. What we're trying to identify here is sort of, first of all, from a very large perspective, these turnkey kinds of projects. The, the, the 
Western Amazon oil development would not have taken place without two main pipelines funneling the oil from the fields to the coast. And we can identify these projects, as, as Ryan has in, indicated very clearly uh, through their, their finance angle, but also uh, bring that information to a more local level through the tools that, like the, the mapping tools that, uh, that we're, we're working on to communities. So you can create awareness of the existence of these planned projects. And in a way, a very helpful and convenient thing about the oil industry and the finance industry in the end is that they are announced well in advance. So you, to the broader investment public, right? And, and a certain subset of society. Uh, that information is often not necessarily clear, transparent, or readily accessible until the company trucks start showing up in on the shores of uh, Lake Albert or uh, in, in Namibia or wherever these kinds of developments take place. And so by having a comprehensive data set of these planned projects and being able to zoom in to where you're interested, where, you, where it affects you is, is key. And as Liliana is, was, was, was voicing, uh, simplicity is really the key as well. We're not talking about deep scientific analysis. This is a one plus one exercise. You are planning something on top of something that already has a designated designation as a protected area or an indigenous uh, area, or is identified as something of being a great value for communities through their water resources, for example. And it's a, it really is a one plus one exercise where you say, wait a minute, you're planning this through that that's 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 going to be a problem and the simplicity of the kinds of analysis with ramsar as, as ryan has illustrated is, is, is showing banks have policies to not invest in uh destructive activities surrounding uh, ramsar sites so that's that's kind of the key but at the community level i think there's a lot of extra work that can be done we can uh through a web interface, allow communities to own this information. It's not our mission to own any of it. It's bringing together knowledge and information and developing the platform through which it can be shared. Um, and so that's how we try to bring it to uh, the local level. That's great. And uh, I think one thing that's really striking about that is that one, um, a really simple analysis that's simply overlaying, you know, a planned pipeline route and a set of of protected wetland areas, um, that are very simple analysis can show that, yeah, these projects are problematic. Um, and and for, for that information to get in the hands of people at the point um, before there's um, um, already a number of investors lined up, before the engineering plans are done, before there's sort of facts on the ground that end up making it inevitable is incredibly important. And, and one of the things that I think is striking about the data that's now available is that not only does it show sort of what's being planned and what's announced and sort of what's, what's on the horizon, but um, by being able to compile, for example, the lease blocks that have recently been put up or leased, you're able to see what's beyond the horizon what's still coming, but at a phase where it's potentially even more, um, um, more subject to being, to being uh, uh, resisted and changed or canceled. Um, so good, um, thanks. Um, Dick Heady raised a question, um, which I don't think we really got into here, but it would be interesting to hear from those of you who are involved in litigation about what are the most effective jurisdictions within which to raise um, litigation about, about such projects. Um, um, Liliana, do you, have a, do you have experience with that in your position as a? Yeah, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> maybe the wrong things, but there are in, in Latin America, there are some cases that are, have been used as, uh, 
yeah, creating jurisprudence. Uh, for example, the, 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 the conflict I mentioned between the national interests and the rights of indigenous peoples, both are existing rights, but one at the national level and the other one is uh, approved in 2007 with the, the, the framework for uh, indigenous peoples' rights. But you see that there are a couple of examples like uh, in Suriname, the Samaka case, the Samaka people against the Surinamese government was like the first time that uh, the free prior informed consent was seen as superior. So from there, you see that uh, yeah, some cases started to succeed. And the case I mentioned was done at the provincial level. And it was actually a, a case with nine girls uh, it was a very small case uh, instead of, you know, something at the national level. So it would be, I, I don't know, uh, the background of, 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 the, of the person ra raising that question, but there, there is a path there of single cases that are creating space uh, for victories that are, you know, giving uh, recognition for the so-called environmental rights. Uh, that are sometimes seen as uh, less important than the national interest, uh, as, I as I was uh, mentioning. So those are cases, all of them, both of them very different. One, the case of the Samaka people was at the, at the um, uh, Inter-American uh, Inter uh, uh, Human Rights Court. So uh, a regional case, but started from a national case. And the other one was a provincial case. Uh, so both won. So uh, it would be good to look at into these strategies. Yeah, I, I think that this speaks to the to the very important point that that we have not been thinking about climate policy in terms of fossil fuel extraction. We've been thinking of it for the last 30 years in terms of emissions control. And so there isn't any sort of a framework, there isn't any sort of a, of a comprehensive approach to policy and legislation and litigation on the extraction side. It really is a patchwork. It's a patchwork across different sizes, different size jurisdictions and different scales. It's a patchwork across different domains, whether it's um, human rights or um, uh, environmental statutes, um, and so it's it's very much a work in progress. Um, UNEP's recent report on, on sort of the state of climate litigation reports that there's more than 800 cases that were in in process this past year um, in a couple dozen countries. And so I think I think uh, Dick, the answer to the question might be that there's it's still. Um, this is an area where a lot of precedent is being set and a lot of, a lot of new battlegrounds are being opened. Um, Omar, I was just wondering, do you have anything to add to that as far as your work on ECOP? Yeah, definitely. Um, so on, uh, on, on litigation uh, as a strategy or a tactic, um, I, I think the, what I've learned so far, because I've been involved in litigation, one, uh, in challenging the uh, Lamu coal plant, uh, which is a coal plant based here in Kenya, um, and also in, in, in challenging uh, the Lamu port as well uh, under the Lapsid project. Um, and and um, I would say for us, in terms of looking at litigation as, as an aspect and something we can take advantage of in the jurisdictions, um, it's something that we'll have to take on a case-by-case -case basis, um, because there are definitely the pros and cons that you have to weigh before you decide whether it's a good strategy to, to implement. Uh, but from the experience that I've been to, um, it, it was a good strategy for us uh, because one, uh, our jurisdiction in Kenya, especially if you go to the environmental tribunal, once you challenge some of these projects, uh, you automatically get uh, an injunction or a stay order, uh, which means that the project cannot proceed in the construction, at least until that case has been had uh, and determined. 
And what this means is now you have an opportunity to implement the other strategies. Uh, people like Ryan now can come in and start pushing on the financials to make sure that the money uh, is never committed. Uh, people like Diana can make sure that the community opposition is seen and therefore affecting uh, the, the, the reputation of, of these particular projects. Um, and it could also mean now working with the policymakers to try and reverse uh, some of the laws that might be sympathetic to some of these fossil fuel projects. Uh, so it helps to give you time uh, at least to push, uh, but some of the uh, of, of the of the disadvantages of litigation uh, is one I've learned that uh, it normally takes a while. Um, you know, it takes anywhere between five to ten years uh, before you are able to you know hear the case until it's determined. Um, and what that means then is that it's also expensive, uh, especially for Africa and in our case in Kenya. Uh, it was the first coal plant in Kenya, and therefore we you know normally the law how it is generally is that he who alleges must prove. And therefore, if you say a project is bad, you have to bring the evidence to convince the court uh, to overturn that project. Uh, and that meant now uh, finding the experts, um, some of them as far back from, from the United States in China and others in South Africa to bring them here at our own cost. Uh, and we are a nonprofit organization and therefore convincing funders to give you the money. Uh, and, and you will see the disadvantages are that sometimes you will go to court and our court systems are unpredictable. You're bringing experts from as far back as the United States here. And then the court it, it decides at the 11th hour that they're not going to proceed uh, because one of the judges was not able to come to court because of stupid reasons, uh, really. Uh, and you have to tell these people to go back and wait for another day to come here. So it, it takes time. It's uh, expensive. Uh, but it's worthwhile it's, if it's giving you that time uh, to, to implement other strategies, because at the end of the day, uh, they, we have a higher chance of stopping these projects before they happen. But once they've broken ground uh, and, and you know, this, um, the, the construction has started, our chances of stopping them are quite minimal. Thanks, Omar. Thanks for some on the ground perspective with a, with a specific project. Um, Diana, you have your hand up. Um, you want to come in? Uh, yes, sure. Thank you. Um, I wanted to share about uh, the legal strategies in our context in Uganda. We are using them and also at uh, the East African Court of Justice. But um, in the Ugandan context, uh, you know, it's not a very encouraging jurisdiction. Uh, our civic space, in Uganda is uh, quite uh, limited and it keeps decreasing. And you also find that though the judiciary isn't part, you know, of uh, part of a, what we would ordinarily call civil society, their independence also is, is, you know, the judiciary isn't as strong and independent as we want it to be. So you find that uh, cases are delayed, but also they are usually decided against um, you know, judges decide against environmental conservation, especially where strong uh, stakeholders who are connected to the political elite are involved. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. Um, I'd like to pick up on a question that Rick raised earlier and directed to you, Ryan. Um, given your, your focus is on finance, um, Rick is asking about the effectiveness of approaches targeting um, uh, shareholders and large investors. Yeah, um, I think um, this is this is this is quite an active strategy in terms of efforts to uh, to advocate for for commercial banks to to reduce their their exposure to, to fossil fuels and to, to stop financing fossil fuel expansion um, and I think it's uh, I think it's a strategy that is that is uh, that is it's really helping to to have an impact um, there are each year there are there are more and more uh, shareholder resolutions that are raised at banks uh, calling for strong climate action um, and uh, there's a, there's a, there's a consistent level of support that they that they get usually, Usually, they don't get a majority uh, of support. Um, an example: this year, there was a there was a shareholder resolution 
put to put to Barclays by uh, our colleagues at Market Forces and uh, and others, um, which was uh, which was calling for a very a very strict commitment to to phase out fossil fuel finance uh, on Paris aligned timescales. Uh, exactly what's what's necessary, and it was uh, it was the the. It, the management of Barclays, of course, uh, advocated firmly for this uh, for this to be to be rejected. Um, it was uh, it was supported or abstained by by twenty five percent of of shareholders. Which is, so it's a, it's an influential amount. It's an amount which will uh, which will uh, push Barclays to uh, to show that it is doing more uh, on this topic. But it but it's not enough. Um, it's not enough to to force management's hand um and you know i think that there are, there are a lot of a lot of large asset managers out there with with big shares in, in banks who, who have who have uh, climate commitments who talk a lot um about about the need to the need to vote in favor of, of climate resolutions uh without without necessarily doing that i think uh, i think you know the, there's there's an active push but i think uh I think this needs to be mainstream, and you know, we we really need to see mainstream um, asset managers consistently voting for um, for the kind of uh, the kind of climate action that is that is necessary. Uh, but I think you know there is a process going on of uh, of um, educating a larger a larger um, a larger uh, group of the, uh, you know the, the asset managers and uh, uh, you know. There is there is growing understanding there. There's, there's further work to be done there. Thanks, Ryan. Um, um, I I have a question I'd like to raise because I I I I think it's among the most important questions and and we haven't we've sort of um, touched on it glancingly, but that's it. And. Um, it is the case that the currently wealthy portions of the world reach their current state um, in good part owing to their exploitation of fossil fuels and the use of fossil energy to power their economies for the last 150 years. Um, and now there are technological alternatives to that, thankfully. Um, but in some, in some cases, in some contexts, given the, given the world we live in now, it's not always the easiest approach. And so as far as, as, far as um, completely foregoing uh, fossil fuel expansion in, in developing countries, I'm wondering, um, Omar, you touched on this. I wonder if you could speak more to this issue of sort of the alternative development path. What are the what is the route look like um, that provides uh, a country that still is energy poor with a source of energy and with a source of jobs or other other uh, um, um, economic uh, uh, benefits of fossil fuel production. Um, yeah, what, is there more you can say about that? And then I'd welcome you as well, Diana. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and I've, I've seen uh, a lot of debate around this in people trying to, uh, to, to justify uh, why Africa has been left behind. Uh, the West uh, and other countries have uh, taken advantage of their fossil fuel um, uh, reserves that they have and resources that they have uh, to take them to the developed status that they are in. Um, but what's being left on that debate um, is the fact that you know having fossil fuels and ex exploiting them is not a guarantee that you're going to develop as a country. Um, we've seen it in Nigeria. They've actually become more poor by exploiting their fossil by their oil resources within the country, and we've seen it with a huge number. Uh, of countries uh, in, in Africa. Um, and, and the thing is, um, what's also being left in this discussion is that uh, when, the when the West was doing it, or the other countries that are developed now, when they were doing and extracting their fossil fuels, 
at that time they didn't know better in terms of uh, some of the impacts uh, that they are causing to the to the world, uh, the carbon emissions and, and tipping us closer uh, to a planetary crisis. Um, and uh, while we do agree that these are resources that are available in Africa um, and that uh, Africa should not exploit them, uh, we also uh, definitely at the same time also say that uh, the developed countries have contributed a huge chunk uh, to where we are today in the planetary crisis. And therefore, Africa, in not exploiting these resources, um, uh, we, we definitely are aware, one, of the potential of the green renewable energy sources. Um, so the more than um, enough availability of solar, of wind, uh, and other renewable energy sources within the country. Um, and, and therefore, the plan will be to come up with a model uh, where uh, one, we are talking about uh, funding the alternative that we're talking about in Africa. Uh, so for those who have contributed to the planetary crisis and benefited from the same to support the impoverished nations that want to use the same model uh, to leapfrog these fossil fuels and reach uh, a position where they are they're imploring or in using um, renewable energy options. So we're talking about funding, uh, we're also talking about technology transfer, because when you talk about renewable energy development, uh, we're not talking about uh, the same situation we're having for scramble for resources in Africa, uh, where we're seeing places like DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo and others, um, having countries coming in and mining some of the resources that are needed for, you know, battery generation and other stuff that are needed for renewable energy options, and then being taken out there to be um, you know, used and, and made by other countries and then brought back to Africa, but support this technology transfer to Africa as well uh, and train uh, these countries towards uh, making sure that we are able to take advantage of this. There are many, many um, research and, and, and uh, papers and analysis that have been done to really paint a picture of uh, leapfrogging from fossil fuels to renewable, just renewable energy um, is not necessarily an economic impediment but actually an opportunity. So we have to look at renewables and just renewable energy, not as um, you know, uh, settling for what will be the least worst thing to do, but actually an opportunity that will make us not only um, avert from the environmental and climate uh, disasters that we are talking about, uh, but also uh, to be able to make a lot of money uh, and, and, and improve our, our people on the same. Um, finally, what I would say is, um, when you talk about uh, fossil fuels and the climate change disasters we're talking about, it's not just about environmental issues. Uh, climate change is costing uh, Africa and the entire world lives and money. I mean, lives and livelihoods. Um, for an instance, uh, the case in Kenya, which I'm more uh, aware of, uh, every year I was reading their uh, uh, NDCs that they released uh, in December just last year. They were saying that climate change is costing us about three to five percent. Uh, as economic costs to our GDP. Uh, that actually means, uh, if you translate it into money, it's about 300, uh, about three to five billion uh, US dollars every year, just from the uh, impacts that are being uh, emanated from climate change. So definitely uh, our aspects of pushing towards uh, renewables is our way of ensuring that we are averting some of these uh, impacts. And to finalize this point in 10 seconds, I would also say that uh, there's also this debate where the people are saying the US, the West are already, uh, you know, extracting more oil than all the countries combined. Uh, and that then uh, how, how can people from the West uh, come and tell us that we should not uh, be exploring some of these resources that we have. Uh, but the, 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 the truth of the matter is that we are affected the most by climate change. Uh, and that by not leading the way of showing how it can be done in a better way, we're actually losing the moral footing of telling JP Morgan and telling the other banks in the West not to finance fossil fuels because we are also looking at the same development model. Um, the definition of insanity is always going to be the same, doing the same thing, but expecting different results. Thank you, Omar. Uh, Diana, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, very quickly to say that um, I do understand the pressure that governments are under to create jobs because uh, Uganda has a very 
high unemployment rate and uh, especially amongst the youthful population that needs to be working. But, uh, you know, while I do recognize that, I say that uh, going the fossil fuel exploitation route isn't the best way to create the jobs because uh, studies have shown that uh, just over 160,000 jobs will be created. These are both direct and indirect jobs. And the experts say that uh, these projections are likely not to materialize. Even less jobs will be created. And while a few jobs are going to be created, many more stand to be lost in agriculture and other, and other fishing, agriculture, fishing, and other uh, economic sectors that are dependent on our environmental conservation. So we, we, we will lose more than we will gain. Uh, interestingly, uh, Uganda has a great green economic potential and uh, the Ugandan government was supported by UNDP among other development partners to do a study that showed that uh, investments in agriculture, tourism, agroforestry and other sectors could create nearly 4 million jobs and uh, add 10% uh, to Uganda's GDP. So we can certainly go green and we can forego fossil fuel exploitation. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Um, I, I, I'll add another part to this story, which is that I think that the, um, the prospects of fossil fuel expansion in countries to actually be economically beneficial are just a lot more dim than they would have been in the past, that there's so much uncertainty about uh, how rapidly ambitious climate policy may come in. There's already a skittishness among many financial um, institutions about investing in fossil fuels, um, that um, the, the likelihood that a given project that requires an investment that has a lifetime of 20 years, 30 years, to actually be yielding a profit for that long, um, I, think, I think a strong claim can be made that it's more dim now than it, it had been previously. Um, I think another, another important point is that uh, often in these financial arrangements between Northern investors in particular and Southern governments, the structure of, the, of those arrangements really are such that the, the risk is, is overwhelmingly transferred to the host country. Um, while, while returns are overwhelmingly appropriated by the, by the investing um, institutions or countries. Um, so I'll just add that. Um, I was wondering if I could bring you in, Ploy. Um, Ploy, as I mentioned, um, a colleague of mine at Stockholm Environment Institute was centrally involved in the production gap report and also, and the coming production gap report, and in the um, trends in fossil fuel extraction report that I also quoted earlier that was looking at uh, expansion plans across different countries. And I'm, I'm wondering, Ploy, um, if there's much of a sign when you look at individual governments and um, the corporations in individual countries about whether there are some countries that are starting to, um, where you're starting to see a signal of their responsiveness to the civil society resistance, to the increasing financial institution skittishness, to the science, um, and you're starting to see projections shift downward and start to become at least edged toward being in line with, uh, with Paris. Any, any good signs? Yeah, thank you, Shivan. I mean, I think there are a few countries we could point to, like Germany, um, who, you know, have put in place a coal face out act, right, but, um, or other countries where you see kind of expected declines in oil and gas production, like Norway and the UK. Um, but in a lot of these cases, you know, they reflect a sort of natural resource depletion rather than a planned manage wind down with equitable and just um, transition policies in place. Um, and, you know, without giving too much away of this year's findings for the production gap report, I just think that in aggregate, we find that basically 
um, the government uh, plans and national energy outlooks of major fossil fuel producing countries still have a, a large disconnect between, you know, kind of what they're saying in terms of net zero targets and um, lofty climate ambitions, and then what the national energy projections actually say in terms of how much they want to expand, um, in particular oil and gas production. Um, and that there's a lot of you know, this kind of narrative of gas being the transition transition fuel without any plans to phase it down in the long term. It also seems that each individual country or each individual corporation feels that uh, um, it can expand because it'll be it'll be the last one standing and it the uh, global path will be consistent with Paris, uh, nonetheless, because the others will phase out more quickly and there doesn't seem to be any uh, any sense or any sort of empirical corroborate, corroborate, co corroboration for any for any view like that. Um, we're coming up toward the end, and um, I'm wondering if there are any of the speakers who would like to add in any point now in response to a question they've seen or something that you feel that we've missed. Um, Ryan, you haven't uh, you haven't had too much of a chance to weigh weigh in in the last bit. Thanks, Ivan. Yeah, I was I was thinking. I mean, on the on the alternatives uh, question, and you've in in the case of the the East Africa crude oil pipeline, you've got you've got total sort of pushing to to lock in the region to a to this sort of dead end development model. Um, you know, with a project where the amount of revenue that it would would gain would really be would be minimal and there's a real trade-off between the amount of revenue that Total would get for this and the amount of revenue that Uganda and Tanzania uh, would make and it's that it's a it's a squabble over peanuts essentially um, but and you know meanwhile you've got development banks like the African Development Bank they've said they won't finance this project um, which is which is positive that's one thing that we're looking for but we, we need them to really step up we need development banks and private sector banks uh, to step up and and bring the alternatives to uh, to projects like this to to the market, so that you, you know Uganda and Tanzania um, aren't just just looking at one proposed development model that the total are pushing them, uh, but you know the 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 renewable based the, the clean energy alternatives um, are, are there and they're they're supported by by real capital from from international investors so uh so you know the alternatives are there but but they they do really need financial support um and a second thing i wanted to add on the question about litigation um was just to emphasize i think the the shell ruling is something we can't really underestimate the importance of um in the, in the here in the netherlands the shell was ordered by 2030 to reduce its emissions by by 45 percent which is really significant and this was based on um human rights norms it was based on the un guiding principles which are very broadly applicable i think that's going to be an influential um an influential ruling i certainly hope it will be and it's i think it's applicable outside of the oil and gas industry and to to finance as well that there are human rights uh reasons why why companies including oil and gas companies and banks as well need to need to meet the goals of the paris agreement and reduce their reduce their emissions rapidly on that kind of time scale thanks ryan thanks ryan that that is helpful i think that 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 is an absolute key that uh that uh especially to the extent that uh the development model that uh is seen to be sort of the default the only proven path to to prosperity which is the one that developed countries have taken um it is it is uh to a good degree the obligation of the currently prosperous countries to help make an alternative development pathway available um everyone thank you so much for joining um i think that uh, it's pretty clear that you whether you look from the global perspective um and see that unambiguously we have to stop fossil fuel production both for biodiversity and climate or whether you look from the local perspective and the ecological impacts and the human impacts that further expansion is causing um, either way the the conclusion is unambiguous and hopefully hopefully um, this work and this collaboration among these groups where we're trying to bring um, global data to bear on the local efforts to 
to stop expansion. Um, hopefully that will be that will be something that can be helpful um, further going on forward, but also maybe serve as a as a um, as a trigger, as an inspiration for other ideas to use this sort of collaboration and uh, and um, 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 accelerated success at phasing out fossil fuels. Thank you very much all for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye all. Thank Thanks you very much. Cheers.